Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlaub, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to meet with two lawyers in Latin America. Juan Carlos Fernandez is in Mexico City, Mexico, and Jose Manuel Abastos is in Lima, Peru. Juan Carlos is a partner in the law firm of Bashan, Rins, y Correa. His practice focuses on planning and consulting in the field of intellectual property. Jose is a partner in Hernandez and Sia law firm. His practice includes banking and finance and corporate law. Both are knowledgeable and very experienced international attorneys. I've asked them to share their views about their respective countries, Latin America and the world, and life and law. We in Hawaii are separated from Mexico and Peru by a large expanse of the Pacific Ocean, but we are all human. And I think we have a lot in common, even though we may not know it. So gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our program. Uh, Juan Carlos, how are you? I'm good. Uh, Mark, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Jose, uh, how's everything? It's, everything is fine. Thank you very much for this invitation. Juan Carlos, great pleasure to be with you as well. Okay, so it, it's, just, it's just great to have you both. Um, and when I made the introduction, I talked about Latin America, and I, I'd like to let get that covered first. And let's, let's put up the, the map of, of Latin America. This is what I looked up, and this is what they say is Latin America. But I, Juan Carlos, your view from Mexico, and Jose from Peru, uh, what is Latin America? Do, do you consider yourselves Latin Americans? How, how do you define that? I mean, is that a realistic view from your countries? So let's let's start with Juan Carlos, and then we'll we'll uh, talk with Jose. That's a very interesting question, Mark. It's the first time I get uh, asked that. I'd say in general, Latin America is defined by geography, of course, and by language. Uh, most Latin American countries speak either Spanish, predominant predominantly, or Portuguese. Mexico is in a particular situation because we're part of the North American continent, but I believe and I feel personally more identified with the rest of the Latin American countries uh, than with the U.S. and Canada. So I, I do believe that Mexico is definitely Latin American and I myself feel Latin American. Hmm. And, and I like the identity that you mentioned. So, uh, Jose, what is your viewpoint? Yes, it's exactly the same as, uh, as Juan Carlos. Uh, we Peruvians, we feel absolutely 100% Latin Americans. We share the same, uh, not only the same continent, but mostly the same language, with the exception of Portuguese. Um, the same uh, history uh, uh, so, uh, and, and many other aspects. So uh, we feel like a large community, and it's an advantage when we travel from Peru to Mexico, for example, that we can uh, use the same language and uh, we have many uh, aspects in common, for example, uh, uh, archaeological matters, history matters, social and cultural matters, and uh, also you can enjoy the differences of all the among all these countries, like the food, for example. Yeah, you know, so this identity, uh, I like that. I like to understand that. That gives us a, be a better view of, of what you think of yourselves and how you, uh, you know, feel about your countries. And there is a, you know, a separation between uh, United States, Canada, and Latin America. And it's it's good to understand that, and thank you for that insight. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about your own law practice, and if you have a if you have a client from a foreign country, say United States or Canada, and they are thinking about doing business in your country, 
What do you tell them? How do you, what, what do you tell them about doing business? Because I hear what you're saying, the cultures are different. Uh, and so how would you introduce them to your country? Uh, and uh, Jose, we'll start with you this time. Uh, well, uh, Peru has a, a very um, friendly legal framework for international investors that want to do business in Peru for the first time. So it has uh, one of the, the, the most friendly legal frameworks in Latin America, which is an advantage. And also the macroeconomy of Peru uh, has been very stable in the past almost 30 years, uh, along with Chile. Uh, uh, so uh, in, those are the, the, the positive aspects of doing business in Peru. And the difficult aspects are that depending on the type of business, um, the regulations can be, could be really cumbersome. And uh, the time suspected in the paper for licenses and permits, for example, could take much longer times than, than originally expected, for example. Okay, so Juan Carlos. Um, I, I focus on intellectual property law. Um, I'd say that probably 80% of, of our clients are from abroad, many of them from the United States. Mexico is a, a, an attractive market because we're 130 million people. Geographically, we have the advantage of being very close to the United States. So we are both a consumer and a manufacturer that is very close to the most powerful economy in the world. So that is always attractive. Uh, whenever a client has interest in doing business in Mexico, uh, we advise them to um, take into account uh, what areas they want to develop. That's uh, a key element to determine if they will want to settle in Mexico, in which part of Mexico. Uh, the, our legal framework is quite stable and, 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 and it's quite uh, friendly also for, for foreign investment. Uh, of course, politics sometimes uh, gets involved in, 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 in economic policy. So right now we have a, government, a federal government that claims to be more on the socialist side. And this has been a bit of a challenge for, for foreign companies, but it hasn't uh, uh, hindered at all uh, the development of new business. So I think that uh, times are good despite of the general uh, economic situation with high inflation, et cetera. Uh, but Mexico is, is still a very attractive market to invest in. Well, that, you know, what you've said in both of your res responses to what I've asked you is, is interesting. In other words, there's cultural differences, but both countries are welcoming investment, welcoming business, and are, are open to that. Now, I, I, I would say that uh, in, in the United States, you know, we, we would have to be educated. We'd have to know that. And it's good to hear that because uh, I think there might, because of the cultural differences that, that some people feel, there might be some reluctance. But I'm hearing open door. And I'm hearing friendly from both of you. Is that a correct type of uh, conclusion? Go. Absolutely. Just, just to give you an example, Mexico is one of the few countries outside of the U.S. where NFL season games are held. We like our culture, we like our roots, but we also like football. And, <laughs> and, and that's an example of how open we are to whatever good things come from abroad. Okay, that's, and that's interesting to hear. Uh, yeah, okay, now let, let, let's talk about current events a little bit. Um, how have Mexico and Peru dealt with the COVID pandemic? Uh, and, and what is the status now? Uh, uh, Juan Carlos, we can, we can start with you. And, and, you know, we've heard different things here in the United States. So clear it up, please. Yeah, but my personal opinion, and this is an opinion shared by most of the private sector in Mexico, is that the federal government did a poor job 
handling the pandemic. Of course, Mexico is a country with a lot of challenges. Our public health system has uh, a lot to improve, but the pandemic caught us up off guard like it did with the rest of the world. But unfortunately, the federal government, um, in terms of strictly speaking on the health side, was erratic in their policies. Uh, they didn't um, uh, foster, for example, the use of masks. Uh, they didn't buy enough tests when they had the opportunity to do so. And on the economic side, which was also a challenge when the lockdown came, came up, is that they didn't provide any support or incentives for small or medium companies. Uh, so in some, I think that most of the measures to, 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 to prevent a larger economic and health impact were implemented by the private sector. It was the private sector who said, you know, mask up and, 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 and go and take a test and isolate if you're positive. And we tried in the, in the, in the however way we could to provide support to our people and, 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 and employees to try to have an economic impact that was not as bad as, as it could have been. But in general, I would say that the government didn't respond well. And right now, the situation in terms of cases is stable. Right now, we're okay. But we, we do feel that with uh, winter coming, cases yeah. may rise again. And we kind of will be on, on our own to, to make the decisions. Uh, Jose? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mark. The Peruvian situation is quite similar to to the Mexican situation of Juan Carlos just explained. Uh, in few words, uh, Peru lost two hundred thousand deaths uh, in less than two years. So that uh, it never happened something like this in Peru. Uh, according to a, a international analysis that I read recently. Peru is a number one or two country in the world with the highest uh, death rate of deaths per habitant because of COVID. Uh, there was a very poor response uh, by the government in connection to, to the pandemic. It was uh, wrong and, uh, and it was late. Uh, the vaccines came late. Uh, people who could travel to the United States to get shots um, it was the, uh, and people who remain here really uh, suffer a lot. Also, the economy was uh, uh, severely uh, impacted in, in that year, in 2020 in particular. The PB, Peruvian PB, uh, GDP uh, decreased by 12%. Next year, if we cover, if we cover all, of the, all the decrease, but uh, uh, it was very sad to see that the government did not um, uh, have any appropriate measure to alleviate the situation. So uh, we also think that the private sector has an important role to cover here. I am a full defender of a PPP's program, private-public partnerships. Uh, governments as, as Peruvians are very poor managers of everything that you can imagine. So the hospitals are run by by the government are really in very bad shape, poor infrastructure, worse services. Uh, so we believe that the good thing of this is that there is a, a, an opportunity to improve not, not only the uh, public health sector, but other public uh, sectors or, or social, let's call social infrastructure, including education, through private investment, through PPPs. That, that's uh, the opportunity that we have here. That's interesting that both of you share, basically, it sounds like the same position and, and there is some concern uh, about what the future holds, but both of you seem to think that private, <laughs> private industry or businesses are more effective and more helpful than uh, the government, which hmm, 
Yeah, I, I, it's interesting to hear that point of view. Uh, is that a correct? Am I correct in that? For both Absolutely. of you? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I mean, I hope things get better for Latin America in general. Uh, and there, there is concern, um, you know, about travel also. Um, now, uh, talking about travel, there is uh, Juan Carlos. I want to, I want to focus on a, on an issue. There's been much publicity in the United States about migrant caravans entering the United States from Mexico, including a, a former president who vowed to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. How do Mexicans see this issue? What do they think sh it, it is about and how should it be handled? Oh, Mark, as you know, immigration is a complex uh, subject. Um, Mexico loses a lot of talent from immigration, but also gains billions of dollars in the remittances that immigrants sent back to their families here. The wall was seen with skepticism because you don't have to be an expert in U.S. geography to know that building a wall along that border is simply impossible. Of course, there was uh, some hurt feelings because some of the things the former president said about Mexicans um, were a bit harsh. You know, Mexicans who, who go to the U.S. risk a lot. They work very hard. They don't have any insurance. They get paid less than the minimum wage. And they work for hours and hours. I know that illegal immigration is something that is not ideal. I understand those sectors in the U.S. who um, ask for strict controls at borders because you don't want to have uh, an exaggerated number of people flowing into the country. There's the issue also of terrorism. There's the issue of, of, of human trafficking that is, uh, goes along with, with, with illegal immigration. Uh, but I think that Mexico has tried to do its part. Actually, illegal immigration from Mexico into the U.S. has decreased uh, 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 through the years. It is immigration from Central America that goes through Mexico, which has been increasing. And because of the pressure of the U.S. government, the Mexican government sent uh, the army into its so our southern border to try to contain these caravans. So it is a very complex subject. Uh, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of money involved. Mexico and, and Latin American countries should provide opportunities for their nationals to have economic and social stability. And immigration should be a matter of choice. Uh, and the U.S. should, I think, value uh, all of the positive things immigrants bring into their economy and into their culture. Uh, it's a win-win situation as long as there is control. So what I hear you saying also is that it, that there's not just one opinion. It's kind of a mixed opinion. Uh, different issues come up and different values are seen on, on, on the side of Mexico about the whole immigration and issue. Is that, is that accurate? Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. Now let me, let me ask, you know, a question that kind of ties Hawaii, Mexico, and Peru together. And that is, we have we have an indigenous population uh, in Hawaii. There was a native population, and the country was taken away with the help of the United States. Spain colonized Mexico and Peru. What is the status of indigenous people, of the Aztecs and Mayas in Mexico and the Incas in Peru? Uh, Jose first. Uh, yes, Mark, Peru has uh, many uh, local native communities with their own languages. Uh, apart of Spanish, the most important language in Peru is Quechua. 
which is a very old language spoken, uh, it is believed by the Incas, uh, and it has many centuries. But also you have many local dialects. You have uh, a, 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 a dialects in the jungle, which are doses. Some of them do not have a writing uh, system. It's only oral. It's quite interesting. So uh, Peru, protect, the Peruvian government protects uh, them, protects those cultures. Of course, they, many of these cultures are at risk. They live in uh, areas of the jungle, for example, that are threatened by illegal deforestation. So uh, it is uh, not an easy uh, job to protect them, but they are, we have, uh, and it's part of our heritage, national heritage, these, these cultures. Peru, it's uh, a mix of all these uh, cultures and languages. Predominantly, the, 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 the most important language is, uh, is Spanish, of course. Yes, okay. Uh, so, Juan, Juan Carlos, what is... Mexico what is has over 68 indigenous groups. Wow. <laughs> um, we're also a, a mixture resulting of Spanish colonization. Um, unfortunately, most of these indigenous peoples have uh, lived in poverty for centuries. Right now, I think we're living a, living a time of revindication in which their traditions and their beliefs are starting to, to gain importance. They are starting to be recognized and respected. But I think that we still have to work a lot on the economic aspect. Of course, their aspirations are different to the normal aspirations of, I would say, capitalism. But one thing is that, and another thing is, is the poverty in which they have been living for centuries. And I think that there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, we have, of course, many remains of these uh, magnificent cultures, but the, the, these original indigenous groups need to, to have a better situation. You know, so I'm hearing that the indigenous people in both countries are being recognized and there is some interest in, in assisting what has happened uh, and help helping them. Is that accurate, this statement? Is that an accurate conclusion? In the case of Mexico, yes. And Peru, yes? Yes, the same, the same one. And then what, what is the relationship with Spain? I mean, Spain was the col colonial power that took over both, con or, or took over the countries from the indigenous people. What is the present relationship with Spain, Juan Carlos? The, the current uh, federal government has requested that Spain um, requests pardon for the colonization. Uh, we were way behind that need for forgiveness. Uh, relations are good. There is good commerce. There is good tourism. But... This, this tractor is being used by the federal to forget of their current mistakes. Okay, Jose? Uh, it is a very good relationship, uh, okay. and it has been historically in the past uh, decades. Uh, of course, Peru, as well as Mexico and most of Latin America, is a mixture of cultures at the beginning in uh, century 16 uh, between the Spanish culture and, and the Peruvian, or Mexican, or Ecuadorian, Colombian cultures. And uh, so we are a result of this, what we call in Spanish mestizaje, which is a combination of different races and, and, and cultures. Um, so today we have a very good relationship regarding business. Spain is one of the most important uh, in, in uh, countries uh, that in, invest in Peru. I mean, uh, Spanish companies are one of the top non-Peruvian investors. Uh, they have, to give you an example, the, the most important uh, telecom company in, in Peru, among other businesses, in oil and gas, etc. Uh, uh, we share the same language, of course. And there has been very little critics in, uh, uh, from Peruvians or 
regarding the responsibility that they that that they had during the the, the conquest of of Peru, which of course caused lots of uh, damage and lives, you know, six hundred years ago. Uh, but that is something that almost at least in Peru is, is not discussed in, with some few exceptions. Okay, I want to want to move on to an issue uh, that Juan Carlos mentioned, and that is tourism. And uh, tourism in Hawaii, Mexico, and Peru, I understand, in your countries is lucrative or has been in the past. Uh, but we've had some some reservations in Hawaii about the damage caused to the natural and cultural environment because of tourism. And I, I want to put up a, a poster of Mexico, uh, a beautiful poster. Uh, of, of really inviting people to come. But what is your each of your country's view of tourism at present? Uh, and Juan Carlos, we'll start with you. Well, the tourism is one of the most important activities for the economy in Mexico. Um, we have, of course, a lot of potential. We have amazing beaches. We have archaeological sites, uh, colonial cities. Uh, Mexico City is one of the most interesting cities to visit at the moment. Uh, so it's it's really one of the most important aspects of our economy, and it's something that we try to take care of. Of course, the pandemic uh, seriously affected tourism, but at the time, uh, it is starting to grow again. So it is something that we try to foster. We try to have people visiting our country. Of course, like you said, it, this has impacts in, in, in the environment, and it's something that we should be careful with. Okay, and Jose, I'd like you to answer the question, but also talk about Machu Picchu, uh, which, by the way, by the way, uh, Hiram Bingham, who was born in Hawaii, is given credit for discovering, uh, along with the help of indigenous farmers in 1911. But so yeah, what is your response? And let's let's oh. put a, a photo of, of Machu Picchu when you when you uh, <laughs> sure. Well, let, let let me start for your last questions about Machu Picchu. Uh, and let's uh, let's imagine for a moment that the ruins that you see right now have been covered by trees, so that it was impossible if you use a drone or a, or a helicopter flying over this area, you couldn't see anything. So the merit of uh, Hiram Bingham, which uh, I didn't know that he was Hawaiian, but that was great to know that, uh, is that he uh, discovered it. He talked to local uh, people living around, and um, he heard their conversations about uh, ancient winds on top of this mountain. So he hired these local people uh, with mules and uh, to go this way up, which is not very easy. And then he found this, uh, imagine yourself, these uh, huge walls uh, covered completely by dense vegetation because it is a tropical area. So it, it, it rains a lot during the uh, half of the year. Uh, and he decided uh, to start cutting this vegetation and, and to uncover all these all these rims. So, that is through. That is why uh, Hiram Bingham is a, a person very important for for Peru and now for the world, as well as in Mexico. And let me tell you that if you take all Latin America as a whole, the two countries that are very similar in many aspects are Mexico and Peru. Mm -hmm. And archaeological, uh, the aspect is one of them. Um, so tourism is very important in Peru as well. Uh, most people. Uh, visit Peru just for, for Machu Picchu and Cusco, which it was the uh, capital of the Inca Empire. Cusco is important because many of its uh, Inca buildings remained. What the Spanish di did when they conquered Peru is they didn't destroy completely the buildings. Uh, what they did is they kept part of the walls, and on top of these, uh, these Inca walls, they build uh, typical colo colo Spanish colonial buildings. So the most dramatic example is uh, the, the Inca temple of Coricancha, which was covered by gold 
it was huge stones covered by planches uh, of, uh, of gold. Uh, what, what the Spanish did is they, um, re, they kept the bases, but on top of this Inca bases, they built a typical Spanish church that you can visit next time that you go to Peru. Uh, so for us, it's very important. What is happening with Machu Picchu? The United Nations uh, declared that Machu Picchu is a, a very important international monument, not only Peruvian, and the, it, it has to be, the Peruvian government has to preserve it. Uh, but the Peruvian government cannot do anything they want with, with Machu Picchu. So they have to follow certain uh, protocol because the, the, the site was receiving too many people uh, and it was creating some, some problems. So it sounds like really uh, Hawaii, Mexico, and Peru, we have a lot of things in common. Now, we only have a couple minutes left, gentlemen. Uh, I want to ask you kind of a personal and deep question in a way. Uh, the world is facing many problems and difficult times. The, the pandemic, which we've talked about, climate change, wars. Is there anything in your home culture or your life experience that gives you hope for the future? Well, Juan Carlos, let's we'll start with you. Well, that is a great question, Mark. Um, from my IP attorney point of view, I would say ingenuity is going to be a key aspect in our future. We're facing all these challenges, uh, but we seem to be able to respond with ingenuity to all of these challenges. We've managed to pollute the oceans with plastic, and we have these creative people trying to come up with solutions for this. The same happens with climate change. The same happens with all of these challenges we have. So I think um, mankind has managed to pollute and, 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 and really complicate the planet. We, we can fix it. Uh, and, and, and from my Mexican perspective, I think a lot has to do with our philosophy and our view of, of life. Um, Mexicans are hardworking and, and happy people. We have a lot of challenges. Like, like I said, we fa we had a hard, we've had a hard time with the pandemic. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, but I think that there's always uh, a way to see the positive side. And this is something that I think should be replicated in the world. We should be more conscious about the impact we're having uh, on our planet. But I think that there's hope. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Jose? Uh, yes, Mark. Uh, uh, yes, of course, we, there's hope in Peru as well. Uh, Peru right now is, is going through a very difficult situation. We have a government that, in my point of view, is not helping Peruvians to have a better education, to have more jobs, uh, and to and, and to improve their their family situation and to improve the economy. So, uh, however, uh, if Pe Peru is still in a good macroeconomic situation, and it is because uh, Peruvians rescued this country at the beginning of the 90s, when Peru uh, was passing through a long period of a dark night, 10 years of uh, terrorism, and a huge economic crisis that created an inflation of, an inflation of 7,000% in just one year, 7,000%. So uh, this ho horrible situation, which was, a, you had two monsters, terrorism killing more than 100,000 people in Peru only, and then this uh, a very poor condition of situation of the economy was fixed up by Peruvians. We did it. We did it, and in a few years, Peru start to recover. And uh, today, the, the Peruvian economy is one of the the uh, uh, the best ones of macroeconomies in in, in Latin America, uh, and it became one of the most important places for uh, foreign investment in Latin America. So we think, I mean, as, as, as Juan Carlos said about Mexico. 
that we Peruvians can do it. We can make our country great again, paraphrasing a famous former Peru, a U.S. president, and that we can we can make it. We did it, and we can make it again. It's not going to be maybe myself, or going to be my children, and in the future, my grandchildren. But uh, there is hope. Well, thank you both for that. And what I hear from both of you saying is that people have caused the problem, but people can solve it, although it may not be easy and it may, it may take time. But uh, it, you both have hope in people. And I think, I think it's because you are international lawyers. I think that helps too. Gentlemen, I, I want to thank you both. Uh, Juan Carlos, Jose, thank you very much for being my guests. It's great to get your insights and your views from your countries. So, aloha, as we say in Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Gracias, Juan Carlos. Gracias, Mark. Yes. Ciao, bye. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.